Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in a song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His, his hands, hands formed, formed the dry land. land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let, let us, us kneel before the Lord. Let's kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are his people, and we are the people of his pasture. The sheep under his care. The vision. The vision. The vision. The vision. The vision is. The vision is Jesus. Good morning, Rising Church. Thank you for your commitment to be gathered together in spirit at 1030 each Sunday. I want to remind you that by keeping that commitment, you encourage and serve one another in this time. We worship the Lord our God, assembled in His Spirit that dwells within us. To open this morning, I want to read from 1 Chronicles and, and let the Word of God call our attention heavenward in worship and in praise. 1 Chronicles 16, starting with verse uh, 23, says, Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Proclaim His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. Ascribe to the Lord families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in splendor of His holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before Him. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, you reign. Lord God, before you, the whole earth trembles. Lord God, I just pray that your spirit would be mighty in us this morning, that God, you would encourage us, that you would bring us hope today, that Lord, we would feel your love. I just ask God that you would move in the hearts of your people, that you would help us in our time of need, that God, you would comfort those feelings of loneliness and you would still our angry hearts. Lord God, I pray your spirit would just move in us and Lord God, that your word would penetrate us in a way that we haven't felt in a while. Lord, please be with us. Please hear our worship. Lord God, let us worship you. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails The wind is strong and the water's deep But I'm not alone here on these open seas 
like a mighty mountain, yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean side, and I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. shadow of your wings, and I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King, and I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Psalm 84, starting with verse 1, says this How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies! I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she places her young near your altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Skipping to verse 8. Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Consider our shield. God, look on the face of your anointed one. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is sad Within your presence, I sink beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts the thousands elsewhere the thousands Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your house, the 
thousand doubts where better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out to you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. And thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. How lovely is your dwelling place. My heart and my flesh cry out for you, the living God. I love songs that come straight from Scripture and speak truth and hope to our hearts. And I want to take a minute at the beginning of our time together to reflect on this particular psalm for a minute. Um, The question on all of our minds right now is, Uh, when are we going to gather together again? And you might be asking that question because you're apprehensive. You're not really sure if you want to gather in groups of people again. You're not really sure if you want to wear a mask or have your temperature checked or uh, socially distance from everyone because we all know that when we get together as a church body, hugs and handshakes are an essential part of our culture. You might be asking, though, because you strongly desire to have that community again, to see people that you love and that you care about, that you worship together with every single week. Um, And we're going on three months of of not being able to gather together and lift God's name on high uh, as one body, uh, praising our one Lord. But regardless of what perspective you're coming from, that's the question. And this week, I've done a lot of reflecting. I've done a lot of listening. I've been trying to divide wisdom from fear. And it's led to a host of questions uh, about the ways that we practice our faith uh, and the attention that we put on some things. On one hand, our hearts have been ripped out, uh, losing the privilege to meet together over the last few months. It's been incredibly painful. But on the other hand, it's been a shaking and a sifting a sanctifying of those of us who religiously attend gatherings and call just simply that action faith. Hebrews 11.1 says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. God guides us then in Hebrews through chapter 11 through a series of giants in the faith. And then in chapter 12, picks back up and says, Therefore, because of, because of faith and, and what it really is, the reality of what's hoped for and, and proof of what is not seen, uh, he says, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, since many have come before us, basically, uh, such a, great, a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, uh, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Our faith is not a list of practices, but a person. This is why we don't just believe that Jesus existed, but we believe in or we believe on Jesus. Faith isn't just that Jesus is there, but in surrendering every defense of ourselves, exposing the darkest secrets of our soul, that 2% of shame and hurt that we have never told anyone, before the throne of God and, and believing that Christ's blood and resurrection, uh, that by Christ's blood and resurrection, we can now approach the throne of God ourselves without fear. And that when we walk into his presence, we know that God isn't going to ask us to explain ourselves, but instead open his arms and say, my child, that's why I gave you my son and my grace. You are welcome here. The gospel is brutally beautiful. It's brutal because we have so much pride. So much of our identity has been corrupted by sin and, and needs to be put to death and sanctified and resurrected again, but beautiful because God is patient and good and works in us to replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh along with giving to us His Holy Spirit. And the fact that God's Spirit dwells within us in this age is incredibly significant. 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. We see here that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, though, the temple was a place where uh, God dwelt among his people. It was not just a place, though. It was a sacred place. It was where God was worshipped. It was where God was revered. It was where God was honored. But the temple veil was torn, and God no longer dwells there. The eternal spirit of God dwells in the body of each person who has embraced the brutally beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ and placed their trust in the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So I ask you this question. How lovely is his dwelling place? God does not dwell in our currently empty building but he does dwell within you. And he cannot give you a heart of flesh if you refuse to lay down on the table and let him remove the heart of stone. Psalm 51 verses 16 through 17 says that you do not want sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. You see, when we gather together again soon in song, in encouragement of one another, in instruction of God's truth, in service to one another and to our community, yet we offer up these, these modern day burnt offerings without a broken spirit and a humbled heart. I wonder then if these acts aren't done in vain. The gathering of saints is an essential part of the Christian walk. My intention is not to downplay its importance at all. Rather, my goal, is in, my goal in expressing these things is to plant truth in our minds, to rightly reorder what I have come to believe is, is a bit of a confused faith. You see, first uh, James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He goes on in verse 26 to say, If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, how many of us have had trouble controlling our tongues since the beginning of this pandemic? How many of us have taken to looking after the hearts of those who are distressed? 
How many of us have taken to not so holy coping mechanisms to deal with the changes, to deal with the loss, to deal with the stress of this pandemic and all the other chaos going in on in our world right now? And how many of those habits have been a stain of the world? Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of his heart. On March 8th, Chuck delivered to you all a message in which he repeated a phrase over and over. Do you remember what that phrase was? It's the heart. It's the heart. I can't fix your heart. The Chuck can't fix your heart. You know what? Even God's law can't fix your heart. The gathering of saints cannot fix your heart. In fact, even you can't fix your heart. But you know who can? The author and the perfecter of our faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who opens up the throne room where the Lord God Almighty is waiting with open arms and who has gifted to us the Spirit of God that counsels us, that guides us, that calls to mind the truth of God so that we can be moved in accordance with heaven. And this is why, this is why the spiritual disciplines we've been covering are of utmost importance. They do not fix anything but they are practices that put us in the position of the heaven in front of the heavenly father in front of our lord and our savior it gets us in tune with the spirit that dwells within us and in fact i want to mention that gathering together in worship and in celebration are disciplines that we'll be talking about at a later date they're absolutely included and essential in the life of a christian but so far We've talked about disciplines that have been focused inward. They've been cultivating that very personal worship and instruction from the Lord. They're ones that grant the Lord access to the heart. The ones that help us get on the table and stay there while the Lord performs the brutally beautiful heart transplant as we transfer trust in ourselves over to trust in the Lord. We can't have one without the other. You can't effectively be the body of Christ alone. But you cannot have excellent and good worship with a group of people who aren't walking in authentic relationship with the Lord. And what does authentic relationship look like? The most authentic relationships are ones where trust abounds, where both sides speak truthfully, both sides speak lovingly, but both sides are heard and feel safe. If it's true that God wants relationship with you, then he wants, to, he wants you to speak with him. And we call that prayer. But God also wants to speak with you. This is where the inner dwelling of the Holy Spirit is so important and we rightly balance our more external practices with ones that are internal. If someone is mowing the lawn and you want them to listen to what you are saying, can they effectively listen to you? If they're watching the latest episode of their favorite TV program or a sports game, are they effectively listening to you? If they've got a book cracked open and they are are engrossed in it, is that person listening? Sure, in, in any of these things, they may listen for a moment. They'll pick their head up. They may turn the mower off for a second, but their mind is on getting back to the task at hand. The chances of that conversation uh, uh, lasting any length of time is, is little to none, and it will be cut short. So while the Spirit may convict us in the middle of a sermon like this one uh, to or move our hearts to a fulfilling love during a worship song, there's a moment that caught your attention, but you're not ready to listen. There's too much noise. Those things are kind of like the Holy Spirit sending you a text message. This is something I'd like to talk with you about. Can we talk later? 
And if you're anything like me, you get busy with something else, you forget, and that message gets lost. What happens if a friend, a spouse, a parent, a child never responds to your messages? Well, we think they don't care about the relationship. And eventually, they just stop reaching out. Now, I'm not trying to say that the Spirit has the mind of mankind, but uh, because God does pursue us persistently. But in terms of a relationship with the Lord, when was the last time you spent some undistracted quality time with Him? When was the last time you spent time with Him in the lovely dwelling place of your soul, distracted by nothing, not your phone, not your pets, not your family, not even your own thoughts? You see, if our goal here is transformation of the self by the Spirit of the Lord, if God is going to work in us and we are going to partner with Him to work out our own salvation so that, so that He can will and work in us and work through us in this world, The spiritual discipline of solitude and silence are an absolute necessity. Henry Nguyen calls solitude the place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born. Richard Foster, in Celebration of Discipline, says the purpose of silence and solitude is to be able to see and hear the Spirit of the Lord speaks to us when our heart is still and silent before the Lord, not when we're rushing about and doing our own thing in our own way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer believed that it was so valuable that he practiced at the beginning of uh, and the ending of every single day. A study of the gospel shows us that oftentimes Jesus got away from the crowds and even his own disciples at times to spend time alone in solitude with the Lord, doing nothing, saying nothing. We don't know exactly what happened, but we know that when we get away with the Lord, something mysterious and holy happens. Now, what does happen in this time of solitude? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, we get uncomfortable. Getting prepped for surgery for the first time is always filled with apprehension and concern. But this is no reason to jump off the surgery table. Chances are, when you drown out the noise that you're accustomed to hearing, you'll try to fill the void with your own noise, your own thoughts. You'll fidget. You'll think of all the things you could be doing that are more productive than just sitting there. I want to quote what Henry Nguyen writes in his book, The Way of the Heart, because the, the way he explains this particular discipline from his own experience is so valuable and, and, and so vulnerable. He says this. He says, In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. In other words, to say nothing, everything that props him up, no friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract. Just me. Naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken, nothing. It is this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude, a nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends, my work, and my distractions so that I can forget my nothingness and make myself believe that I am worth something. But that is not all. As soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, and weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys in a banana tree. Anger and greed begin to show their ugly faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies and dream lustful dreams in which I am wealthy, influential, and very attractive. Or poor, ugly and in need of immediate consolation. Thus I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness and restore my false self in all of its vainglory. The wisdom of the desert is that the confrontation with our own frightening nothingness forces us 
to surrender ourselves totally and unconditionally to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is brutally beautiful. So often, so often, we try to live the Christian life by doing, doing, and doing some more. Faith rooted in Christ, though, will necessarily move us to service and, and to worship with other saints, to gospel-centered conversations, and to all kinds of compassionate acts. But the reality is that in solitude, we come face to face with the Lord and he rightly exposes us for what we are without him. Revelation 3, 15 through uh, 17 gives an, an, uh, uh, an idea of this exposing uh, in, in, in prophecy. It says, I know your works that you are neither hot, uh, cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say I'm rich because I, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize, you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. John 15, 5, we hear Jesus say, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow runners in the race to heaven, my heart's burden is that you would know Christ for God's glory and that you would make him known in our community for only for the glory of God and his kingdom. But we can do nothing if the Lord is not represented in the innermost places of our souls and rising church means nothing if the people of this body are not connected to the head to the vine that is our righteousness and source of life. These disciplines that we've been talking about are countercultural. They're not things we've been taught. But clearly, the way we've been taught is not helping anything because you see the state of our nation right now, right? You see the riots, you see the heartache, you see the injustice, you see the corruption. You hear the voices crying out for something better. They're crying out for hope. And we cannot show the world hope if we are, are, find ourselves hopeless and without answers ourselves. Cody Carnes sings a song called Run to the Father that has these lyrics. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. Church, I'm excited to meet with you again. And it's coming, it's coming soon. We're, we're a little behind other churches and there's reason for that. But let us not run back to our building without first running to the Father. Let us not run to our own creations of worship without first running to the Father. Let us not expect lawmakers to legislate God's light in the world, but let us run to the Father again and again and again and again, let God begin a silent revolution in our hearts against our very own rebellion. Let him quietly clothe our nakedness. Let him determine our immense value. And when all of what has been sourced in him, when all of that is what we have, and that's all we have, we will have nothing to fear. In the discipline of solitude, we are reminded how weak we are, and yet somehow by the Spirit dwelling in the lovely temple of our souls, He is strong and gifts us His strength. We will be captives set free. 
and we can show the other captives the way to hope. Church, be the temple. Be the light. Be still. And then you will surely know and have hope that he is God. Lamentations 3, 25 through 26 says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, I just pray for Rising Church right now. Lord God, that we would run to you that we would not run to our practices and our, our created forms of worship. But Father God, when we do get to gather together again, a passion would be so strong in us because we've had the time and we've put in the work, God, to draw close to you, to develop this relationship with you, to spend time in quiet with you, withdrawn from the world and withdrawn from our social media, withdrawn from the TV, withdrawn from our phone conversations, that, Lord God, we would abstain from the things that pull us away and capture our attention every single moment of every single day, and that, God, a passion would rise up in us. That, God, we would seek your face and not just your hand. That, God, we would come face to face with you, and, Lord, we would recognize that we are nothing without you. Lord God, stir a passion in us that we would cry out for you and we would cry out for you alone, Lord God. That, Lord, in our innermost being, you would begin a work, you would continue a work that heals us, that makes us clean with pure hearts, that enables us to speak when we need to speak and enables us to be quiet when our mouths need to be quiet. Lord God, help us to reign in our thoughts, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to you, Lord God. And that we would be courageous enough to enter into your lovely dwelling place with you, God. And we would meet with you and worship you there. Lord God, be with us. Help us. And we thank you so much for Jesus by which all these things are possible. It's in his name that we pray.
Each and every Sunday, we take a few minutes to meet around the Lord's table in remembrance of Jesus. This practice is important to us as followers of Christ because it calls to mind in a physical way the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. Remember that at the last meal Jesus had before he was crucified, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. When we eat the bread, we remember that Jesus bore the wrath we deserved as a result of our sin. And then Jesus took a cup of wine and he asked his disciples to drink it, remembering the new covenant of grace bought with his blood, which signified his life that was willingly given in our place and also represents our hope of eternal life by his resurrection from the dead. We take this time to honor and to remember Jesus for being our Savior, dying in our place, and giving us new life in God's grace. So as you prepare, take a moment to pray, to worship God, thanking Him for Jesus. And if you are a Lord, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to participate in the remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in taking communion together at this time.
Rising Church, the Lord dwells within you. When the church assembles as we just have, even though separated, God is honored and glorified, and the body of Christ is encouraged and edified. Remember that the Lord is good, He is mighty, and He has defeated our greatest enemy of sin and death forever. The Lord loves you. So let us leave this sacred space and worship Him with our very lives. Thank you for worshiping together today. Go in peace, my friends. And always remember, the vision is Jesus. Jesus.